Now, in Revelation chapter 10, we just finished up with the events of the fifth and sixth trumpet. And before we get into the seventh trumpet, God spends some time in chapters 10 and 11 uh, just talking about some things that have to do with the seventh trumpet and things that lead up to the seventh trumpet. Look at chapter 10, verse number 1. It says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So I want you to get the picture here. This mighty angel comes down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, rainbow on his head. His face is as bright as the sun. And he comes down and sets one foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth. And he cries with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. When he had cried, Seven thunders uttered their voices, and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. So these seven thunders that utter their voices, when the angel cries out, uh, they're saying something. They're giving some information, but for some reason, God does not want us to have that information at this time because he says to John, actually, I'm sorry, the angel tells him, it says he was about to write, but he heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. So John hears what the seven thunders have to say. He goes to write it down and he's told, do not write that down. Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. This is really interesting because the book of Revelation is so open with us and it reveals so much to us and God gives us so much information that it's, it's strange here that this is the only place in Revelation where God is withholding some piece of information from us. I'm not sure why it's being withheld, but something that those seven thunders uttered is something that we are not supposed to know about. And I've often wondered about it and tried to figure it out, but obviously he just doesn't want us to know. We'll find out someday. But it says in verse 5, the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, the same angel, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Now, this ties in heavily with Daniel chapter 12. And I'm going to take you to Daniel 12 in just a moment. In fact, if you want to turn there, you can, because that's where we're going in just a moment. But let me say this, some people have misunderstood this statement in chapter 10 where he swears that there shall be time no longer. Uh, some people have misinterpreted that to say, well, this means that time is going to cease to exist from here on out. That's not what he means at all, because after this point, we still have the millennium or the thousand year reign of Christ. Well, if we have a thousand years, obviously we're measuring time. So time still exists after the seventh angel sounds the trumpet. But what he's saying is, there shall be time no longer, and then there's a colon there, and then it says, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he had declared to his servants the prophets. And so what he's saying there is that when the seventh trumpet sounds, the time that will be no longer is there will be no more time remaining until the mystery of God is finished. So when the seventh angel begins to sound the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God will be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. Now, I'm going to get into what that mystery is in a moment. But first of all, let's go to Daniel chapter 12, and let's compare what we've seen so far in Revelation 10 with what we see in Daniel chapter 12, because there's something very similar in Daniel chapter 12. But I want to start at the beginning of Daniel chapter 12 and go through it verse by verse. It says in Daniel 12, 1, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. So verse 1 right there is just packed with information. Let's break it down slowly here. It says, first of all, that there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. Well, compare that to Matthew 24, when the Bible says, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor nor ever shall be. We see that trouble and tribulation are often used interchangeably 
in the Bible. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So in 2 Corinthians 1, he uses trouble and tribulation interchangeably. Throughout the Bible, you'll see the words trouble and tribulation used interchangeably. So when he says there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, that is the same period of time that he's referring to in Matthew 24, verse 21, when he says, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor nor ever shall be. So we're dealing with the great tribulation. Well, now let's start at the beginning of the verse and read it again. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. This is talking about Michael the archangel. It says Michael will stand up and there shall be a time of trouble such as was not, you know, since the world began and so forth. Because we're tying it in with Matthew 24. Well, in Revelation chapter 12, do you remember the scripture about there being a war in heaven? And it says, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. That's what's being alluded to in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. So what the Bible's telling us is that Michael the archangel is going to battle with the devil. We read about it in chapter 12, and the devil's going to be cast out of heaven. He's going to be cast down to the earth. And when the devil is cast down to the earth, the Bible says that he has great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And so when the devil is cast down to the earth, he knows he has a short time. He goes to persecute the woman which brought forth the man-child. We'll deal with that in the sermon on Revelation 12. But then it says at the end, it says the dragon was wroth with the woman, last verse of chapter 12, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And what do we see in the next chapter, chapter 13? But we see Satan making war with the saints through the Antichrist. The dragon or Satan puts the Antichrist in power to make war with the saints, to make war with God's people. And that is taking place in chapter 13. We see the mark of the beast and all that. That is known as the Great Tribulation, that period of persecution. People are being killed and beheaded for not taking the mark of the beast and so on and so forth. So that matches perfectly with Daniel chapter 12 because in chapter 12 of Revelation, the devil's cast out of heaven. He goes to make war with the saints. That's what basically initiates the tribulation is the devil being cast down to the earth and then he goes out to persecute. The first the woman, then the saved. Okay, and we'll get into that more in the Revelation 12 sermon. Now let's look at it in Daniel 12, 1 again with that in mind. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. We know that's referring to where he fights against the devil, cast the dragon out of heaven. And there shall be a time of trouble. So there's the tribulation. Uh, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And then look at this. And at that time, thou people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. And that's obviously referring to uh, those that are saved, that are going to be delivered at that time. So it's a perfect order here. Devils cast out of heaven, great tribulation, then the rapture. Okay, because it says in verse 2, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. That's a resurrection there. Do you see that? Some to uh, everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So in Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, here are the events. Michael stands up and, and basically fights against the dragon, casts him out of heaven. When he gets down to the earth, he goes out to persecute first the woman then he persecutes the remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That period where he is persecuting the saints and so forth is called the Great Tribulation. After that, basically, the saved are resurrected. Everyone whose name is in the book is delivered. The rapture takes place. But first, the dead in Christ rise. Then we which are alive and remain are caught up together with them in the clouds. And, uh, and, then, and so on and so forth. Now look at verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now here's the tie-in with Revelation 10. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on the side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, 
which was upon the waters of the river. How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a an half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So, what do we have here? We have two angels, one of them standing on one side of a river, and one of them standing on the other side of the river. And one of them says to the one on this side of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? He lifts up his hands to heaven and swears by him that liveth forever and ever that it shall be for a time and times at half a time. Well, what's interesting is that in Revelation 10, what do we see? An angel standing with one foot on the sea and another foot on the earth, lifting up his hand to heaven and swearing by him that liveth forever and ever that there shall be time no longer. So what I believe is that these two angels standing on either side of the river, one of them that says it shall be for a time and half a time, as we see in Daniel 12, but then the other angel we see in Revelation 10 on the other side of the river saying there shall be time no longer. So we're dealing with a three and a half year period between the angel that speaks in Daniel 12 and the angel that speaks in Revelation chapter 10. And the reason I say three and a half years is that when the Bible says time and times and half a time, it's referring to three and a half years or three and a half periods of time because time is one, right? Then we have times and then a half a time. So what's one plus two plus a half? Three and a half. And I'll, I'll show you that a little bit later in the sermon how uh, time and times and half a times is used synonymously with three years. Now, it says that there will be a time and time and half a times at the end of verse 7 there, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And that's similar to the statement in Revelation 10 where he says the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. You say, Pastor Anderson, I don't understand anything that you just said. Well, join the club because Daniel didn't understand it either. Because it says in verse number 8, and I heard, but I understood not. So if you don't understand what I've just explained, well, neither did Daniel at that time. And hopefully you'll understand it by the end of the sermon tonight. It says, uh, I understood not. Then said I, oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Verse 9. And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now, I've got good news for you, though. We're living in the time of the end because in Revelation chapter 22, at the very end of the book of Revelation, the Bible says in verse 10, and he said unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. So at the end of the book of Daniel, Daniel said, I don't understand these things. And God said, go thy way, Daniel, seal up the words. It's not until the time of the end. At the end of Revelation, he says, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of the book for the time is at hand. And so we today with the book of Revelation in our hand, can understand what Daniel failed to understand in the book of Daniel. So the fact that I just read it to you from Daniel chapter 12 and you're scratching your head having trouble understanding it makes perfect sense because he didn't understand it either. But when we combine it with the book of Revelation, it will make sense and you will understand it. And if Daniel would have had the book of Revelation available to him, he would have understood it too. Okay, verse 10, many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So God is saying, look, Daniel, you don't understand this now, but at the time of the end, people will understand it. But is he saying that everyone's going to understand it at the time of the end? No, he's saying the righteous will understand it in the time of the end but none of the wicked shall understand. So in order to be able to understand biblical prophecy, you know what the first thing you got to do is be saved. And a lot of people, the reason they don't understand biblical prophecy is because they're not saved. Because the Bible says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. And I often find that when someone's very confused about biblical prophecy and cannot understand basic simple truths, and I know tonight's sermon is not that basic, but other sermons that are really basic on Bible prophecy and it goes right over their head, you know, then you talk to those same people about salvation and they're wrong on salvation.
They don't believe it's by grace through faith. They don't believe that everlasting life is the gift of God to whosoever believeth. And then it makes perfect sense why they don't understand. Because they don't have the Holy Spirit inside them to teach them and to guide them. And the Bible's clear, none of the wicked shall understand. And of course, we don't have our own righteousness, but we are righteous through the blood of Christ, through our Savior. Then in the next three verses, he gives some very, very specific key information about the end times. He says in verse 11, From the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. A little earlier in the chapter, what did the angel say when he swore by him that liveth forever and ever? He said, until the end, there shall be a time, times, and half a times. That is three and a half years. Well, that matches perfectly with verse 11 when it says from the time, meaning starting with the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination that make it desolate set up, he says there shall be 1,290 days. So from the abomination of desolation to the end, he says there will be 1,290 days. Well, just to help you out, 1,290 days is three and a half years. Now, go if you would, keep your finger in Daniel 12 there. Go back to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. This is where we see uh, what people call Daniel's 70th week, this seven-year period in end times Bible prophecy. It says in verse 27, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So according to Daniel 9, verse 27, at what point in the seven-year period, or Daniel's 70th week, as people like to call it, at what point in that seven years does the abomination take place according to Daniel 9, 27? It happens in the midst of the week, doesn't it? He says in the midst of the week, the abomination of desolation takes place. Now, if we compare that to Daniel chapter 12, he says, from the abomination of desolation to the end, there shall be 1,290 days. Now, before I go any further, let me just explain to you how the Bible reckons days and months and years and what calendar the Bible uses. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible very consistently uses 30-day months. Therefore, God is not on the exact same type of calendar that we're on because our months are not all 30 days, are they? 30 days hath September, April, June, and November, but all the rest have 31, save February with 28, okay? So February has 28 days. We have a lot of days with 31, 30, and so forth. Therefore, our year contains 365 days, does it not? Well, in the Bible, the year consists of 12 months of 30 days each, which makes a year of 360 days, not 365. But when you're using a system that only has 360 days in a year, you are not in sync with the sun and with the Earth's rotation around the sun, because how long does it take the Earth to go around the sun? Approximately 365 and a quarter days. Now, 365 days is not in perfect sync with the sun either, which is why every four years, what do we need? A leap year, right? But every hundred years, we don't have a leap year because it's not exactly 365 and a quarter. So even our calendar is, is not perfect and has to have adjustments made to keep us in line with the sun. Otherwise, over the course of hundreds and hundreds of years, th those quarter days would add up and pretty soon it'll be Christmas in July. You know, it'll be snowing outside and, and it's supposed to be summertime and that wouldn't make any sense. Well, if you're on the Bible system of time with 12, 30 day months, you're really gonna go out of sync with the sun fast, aren't you? Because you're, you're five, five and a quarter days off all the time. And so you're continually going to be going out of sync with the sun. That's why when you use the system that the Bible uses of a 360-day year, 12, 30-day months, you must every six years add an extra month, right? 
because six times five is 30. And so the five days that you're losing every year, those add up after six years to 30 days, you tag on an extra month to make up for that. You say, Pastor Anderson, who in the world has ever used such a system? I know you're saying it's in the Bible. And yeah, we can go back to Noah's day and he equates 150 days to five months. In the book of Revelation, in the book of Daniel, he equates 1,260 days to three and a half years. He equates 42 months to 1,260 days. But you say, is there an example in our world of people using this calendar today? Believe it or not, the Iranians, the Persians, used this calendar for thousands of years. In fact, the longest known running calendar, known to man, that can be documented is a Persian calendar that has gone off of these 360-day years, okay, adding a leap month. I'm calling it a leap month, you know, just adding an extra month every six years to bring things in line with the heavenly bodies. Because remember, in Genesis 1, the Bible very clearly tells us that one of the purposes of the sun and moon and stars is that they will help us with uh, signs and seasons and days and months and years. So to teach that, oh, there's a 360-day year and it has nothing to do with the sun and moon, that's bizarre because, you know, without adding these extra months, you're going to be having, you know, springtime and harvest and summer and winter coming at all the wrong times in the year. It's not going to make sense. It would totally mess up God's feast days in Leviticus 23. So that is why... When you study the book of Revelation, it's very clear that the first half of Daniel's 70th week is often referred to as lasting for 1260 days. But the second half of Daniel's 70th week is mentioned as lasting for 1290 days. Why is that? Because 42 months at 30 days is 1260 days. But by the time we get to the second half of Daniel's 70th week, we must add an extra month. Because every six years, you've got to add that extra month to keep it in line with the heavenly bodies. Therefore, if God's talking about a week or a seven-year period, it would not be a complete seven years with 84 months of 30 days each. 2,520 days is not going to cut it. you got to add in that extra month. And then you're up to 2,550 days for the entire week. 1,260 in the first half. 1290 in the second half. That's why the abomination of desolation happens in the middle of the week. And from the abomination of desolation going forward, the Bible says in Daniel 12, 1, there shall be 1,290 days. All right? Look at the next verse. Verse 12. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt, stand, shalt rest and shalt stand in thy lot at the end of the days. So there are two key numbers given here at the end of Daniel 12. There's the 1290 day number, which is talking about what? The second half of Daniel's 70th week. From the abomination of desolation going forward. Okay? And then we know at that time it's over. Okay? Well, what's the 1335 day period? Well, there's no room to fit the 1,335 days in the second half. Second half of the week only lasts 1,290 days. 1,335 days would be more than that. Not going to happen. But not only that, the Bible's clear in verse 13 that Daniel will rest and will stand in his lot at the end of the days. What are the days? The 1,335 days that he just mentioned. Let me read it to you again. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand. 305 and 30 days, but go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days, referring to the 1335 days that he just mentioned. So if Daniel is rising again after the 1335 days, if we were to start those 1335 days at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week, how long is 1335 days? Well, the first 1260 days of that would bring us to the abomination of the desolation. And then that leaves us with 75 more days, doesn't it? Because 1335 is more than three and a half years. It's actually two and a half months into the second half. So with that in mind, if Daniel is going to rise again or be resurrected 
at the end of the 1,335 days, that would mean that the 1,335 days is referring to what we know as the rapture or the first resurrection. Because when Jesus Christ comes in the clouds, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now you say, Pastor Anderson, wasn't Daniel already resurrected at some past time? I know there are people out there that teach that, you know, when Jesus rose from the dead, all the Old Testament saints rose. That's a false doctrine because it says in Acts 2.29, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. So according to Acts 2.29, David was still in the grave, in the sepulcher, bodily, after the resurrection of Christ when Peter is preaching at the day of Pentecost. David's in the grave. Well, guess what? Daniel was in the grave too. All of the Old Testament saints were still in the grave when Peter preached that sermon. They will be resurrected in the first resurrection when Christ comes in the clouds. The dead in Christ will rise first. That'll be David's dead body. That'll be Daniel's dead body. That'll be all the Old Testament saints. That'll be all the New Testament saints. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So, if that resurrection of Daniel is taking place 1335 days into Daniel's 70th week or during the second half of Daniel's 70th week, what does that mean? That means that 1260 days into Daniel's 70th week is the abomination of desolation. Well, when the Bible says in Matthew 24, when we see the abomination of desolation, he says, then shall be great tribulation. That's where we see a lot of people being killed for the cause of Christ. That's where we see the Antichrist come into total control at the abomination of desolation, where he is ruling over every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and where he's causing everyone to have to have a mark in their right hand or in their forehead to buy or sell. That is the time of trouble unlike anything the world has ever seen, right? And that takes place at the midpoint. That means there are 75 more days until we're raptured. There are 75 more days until we are caught up in the clouds right after the dead in Christ rise. That means the period of great tribulation will last for 75 days. You know, there will be a time of trouble and tribulation, obviously, for the three and a half years leading up to the abomination of desolation. But when great tribulation begins, is at that abomination, that's the one where basically believers are being killed en masse. And look, it's a good thing that that period only is lasting for 75 days. Because if those days had not been shortened, no flesh would be saved. I mean, if, if, if the Antichrist were allowed to persecute God's people for the whole 42 months of his reign, I mean, there'd be no flesh saved, would there? I mean, nobody could survive. Because of the fact, and again, I'll go into that more in, uh, in the sermon on chapter 13. But you understand what I'm saying. That uh, there are two key numbers here. 1,290 days from the abomination to the end of the week. And 1,335 days from the beginning of the week unto the resurrection of Daniel. Unto the resurrection of all believers. Unto the rapture. Okay. Or Christ coming in the clouds. And so on and so forth. To me, this is a clear passage, but even to confirm this more, remember what we talked about back in Revelation chapter 2, where he said, you shall have tribulation for 10 days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. Those 10 days are symbolic of the 10 days of the Hebrew calendar, where the first day of the seventh month is the blowing of the trumpets at the exact midpoint of the Hebrew calendar year, which represents the abomination of desolation at the exact midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. And then if you remember on the 10th day of the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar, we have the trumpet of Jubilee sounding, which the trumpet of Jubilee represents the trumpet of liberty, the trumpet of the rapture where the trumpet sounds and we are gathered unto our inheritance in the heavens. And so what is the distance between the exact midpoint of the Hebrew year to the 10th day of the seventh month when the trumpet of the Jubilee sounds? Obviously, those are 10 days, the first 10 days of that seventh month. That's what he's referring to in Revelation 2. And I, and I went into it in more detail in my Revelation 2 sermon. You know, hopefully you were there and you heard it before you're hearing this sermon. But those 10 days are the 10 days he's referring to of tribulation. You say, well, the tribulation lasts for 75 days. That's the great tribulation, that is. 
That's because we're dealing with a seven-year period as opposed to a one-year Hebrew calendar year. And that's why if you take the number 1,335 and divide it by seven, since we're dealing with only one year as opposed to seven years, if you take 1,335 divided by seven, it comes out to 190.71. Well, what's the 190th day of the year? The 10th day of the seventh month. When does the trumpet of the Jubilee sound? 10th day of the seventh month. When does the rapture take place? 1,335 days into Daniel's 70th week. Now, that's enough in Daniel 12. Let's finish out in Revelation. But we needed the information we just gained in Revelation to understand the rest of what I'm going to show you from Revelation. We needed Daniel 12. Now, people will often accuse me of setting a date for the rapture. Now, has anything I said in the last 10 minutes set a date of the rapture? Have I mentioned any calendar dates or years? Look, I have no clue when the rapture will take place. I have no clue when Christ's coming in the clouds will be. I have not the slightest idea. It could happen in the next 10 years. It could happen 100 years from now. It could happen in my lifetime. It might happen long after I'm gone. I have no clue when it's going to be. I have not set a day. I will not seek to set a day. And they say, well, the Bible says no man knoweth the day or the hour. You're saying it happens 1,335 days into Daniel's 70th week. You're pinpointing the day. No, I'm not. Because we don't know when Daniel's 70th week begins, do we? So I'm not setting a date. Now, people will often say, well, yeah, but once it begins, we'll know. But hold on a minute. Will we really know? Because the Bible says that the week begins with the Antichrist confirming the covenant with many for one week. How do we know that's going to be a public event? We may not know when that confirmation of the covenant with many. Oh, the peace treaty with Israel. It doesn't say peace treaty with Israel. That's what your prophecy teacher taught you. It says he'll confirm the covenant with many for one week. It doesn't mention making a peace treaty with Israel. There's no peace in the first half of Daniel's 70th week. The second seal is world warfare. People will say, oh, the first half of Daniel's 70th week is a period of peace. That is such a lie. The second seal is open and the whole world's at war. That's the second seal. But the covenant confirmed with many for one week could take place behind closed doors in a smoke-filled room for all we know. We're not necessarily going to know when that begins to start counting the 1,335 days, okay? But let's say when the abomination of desolation takes place, will we know the exact day that the abomination is set up? Uh, you know, I think it's very likely that we will. So at that point, yeah, you could count 75 days. But here's the thing. At that point, we're so far into this anyway. We're getting so close to the end. We're only two and a half months away from it at that point. We've already seen the events of the first, second, third, fourth, and, and fifth seals. We've seen the abomination of desolation. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. I mean, obviously, there's going to eventually come a point where we realize, hey, we're into Daniel's 70th week. Hey, uh, there's a one world government. Hey, the Antichrist is asking us to take a mark to buy or sell. So yeah, at that time, obviously we know that it's about to happen. So here's the key. Jesus did not say, no man will ever know the day or the hour of my coming. He said, no man knows now. When he was talking back then, no man knoweth the day or the hour, but my father only. Okay, so obviously, okay, let me put it to you this way. After it happens, will we know the day or the hour? Obviously, after it happens, looking back, we'll be able to know. Well, guess what? As we get very close to it, at that point, we will also know when it's coming, if we're in the know, if we've studied our Bibles. And so, obviously, when we see the, the sun and moon darkened, right, we'll know it's going to happen today. Here it is. You know, here it comes. And so, uh, that whole argument of uh, claiming that it's date setting to say that it happens 1335 into the week that just falls apart because we're not setting any year, we're not setting any month. And, and frankly, I don't know what day or what calendar month his coming will be. When I say the 10th day of the seventh month, I'm not talking about according to our calendar. I'm not even talking about according to the Hebrew calendar. I'm talking about symbolically according to the Hebrew calendar, meaning that it will be at that point in Daniel's 70th week, 1335 days in. I don't know whether this is going to be December, January, Mar I have no clue what month, what day, or what year. So I am not setting any kind of a date, and I never have, and I never will. 
until I see the abomination of desolation, then I'm going to start setting a date. Hopefully I'm still alive at that time. So what did we learn from Daniel 12 in a nutshell? Well, we learned basically that there's a seven-year period. We learned that by comparing, you know, Daniel 9, Daniel 12, a lot of the scriptures. There's a seven-year period. Halfway through that period, there's the abomination of desolation. There are 1,290 days remaining after that. The time of tribulation comes before the rapture. We saw that in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, and so on and so forth. Now, with that, all, all that information in mind, keeping in mind what the angel said about a time and times and half a time, until the end. And then looking at Revelation 10, verse 6, it says this, very similar to what we saw in Daniel 12, except that the time is different. The angel in Daniel 12 lifted up his hand and swore that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. The angel in Revelation 10 lifts up his hand, verse 5, the angel which I saw stand upon the scene upon the earth, lift up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things that there are in, that there should be time no longer. So no more time, times, half a time. He said, this is it. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, here's the key, when he shall begin to sound. The mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophet. So, the mystery of God is finished in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound. So, when we talk about the events of the seventh trumpet, when is the mystery of God finished? At the beginning of the events of the seventh trumpet or at the end of the events of the seventh trumpet? At the beginning, right? So, this isn't the very, very end of things. Because the seventh trumpet still has to sound and the events of the seventh trumpet have to play out, which we see recorded in chapter 11. So, he says that the mystery of God should be finished. What is he referring to when he says the mystery of God? Go to Romans 11.25. Romans 11.25 will tell us what the mystery of God is. That will be finished in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound. Look at Romans 11, verse 25. It says... For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So the mystery in Romans 11.25 is that blindness is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Now, first of all, let it be said that when it says all Israel shall be saved, it's important to get the context of uh, the whole passage of chapters 9 through 11 of Romans, because in chapter 9, he says in verse 6, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are called Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So in chapters 9 and 10 and 11, he already explained to us how, you know, the true Israel is only those who are believers, okay? And that the rest of the Israelites who don't believe have been broken off of the olive tree. They are not part of the olive tree. They are not part of the nation. So notice what he said there, that the mystery of God there in Romans 11, 25 through 27 was the fact that blindness had happened. Let me, let me go there again and just make sure I get the exact wording. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So the mystery that's being finished, I believe, in Revelation 10 is the fullness of the Gentiles being come in, referred to in Romans 11, 25 through 27. Now, go, if you would, to Revelation chapter number 11 now. Revelation chapter number 11. And let's see if we can figure out when the fullness of the Gentiles is come in, shall we? It says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. So right there we see 
that there is a 42 month period or a 1260 day period in which Jerusalem shall lay desolate and where the holy city shall be trodden underfoot of the Gentiles. It says, it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they trod underfoot 40 and two months. Now, you might look at that 1260 days or 42 months and say, oh, that's the first half of Daniel's 70 week. Wrong. Because you have to understand that the reason why this is only 1260 days instead of 1290 full days, even though it's in the second half. Because look, when does the abomination of desolation take place? The midpoint. Well, when is Jerusalem going to be trodden underfoot and made desolate at the abomination of desolation? Okay, and if we compare Daniel and Revelation, I don't have time to show you all the scriptures, but clearly Revelation 11, uh, 1 and 2 lines up with the abomination. Well, the witnesses begin to prophesy when the city is laid desolate at the abomination of desolation. The city is desolate for 42 months. They prophesy for 1260 days. But if you remember, after they're done prophesying, then the Antichrist makes war with them. Then he kills them. Then they lay in the street for three days. Then they're resurrected. So there are still things that have to happen in those final 30 days. Okay. But those are the days, that final 30 days, are the days where the seventh trumpet sounds and those events are carried out. Let's compare this quickly to Luke 21, 24. The Bible reads, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword. And this is referring to people uh, dwelling in Jerusalem and in Judea. He says, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So, he says there, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. That's exactly what we saw in, in Revelation 11, 1 through 3. And he says, until the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled. How long shall the city be trodden down of the Gentiles according to Revelation 11, 2? 42 months. So, when is the time of the Gentiles fulfilled? 42 months after the abomination of desolation, according to Luke 21, 24, and Revelation 11, 2, and 3, uh, 42 months after the abomination of desolation, the time of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled. Well, the Bible says, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants the prophets. What is the mystery of God being finished? Romans 11, 25, and 27 tells us that it is the fullness of the Gentiles being come in. It is blindness in part happening unto the Gentiles until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. When is the fullness of the Gentiles come in? When does the time of the Gentiles end? When will the Gentiles cease to have control of Jerusalem? Well, that is 42 months after the abomination of desolation. That is approximately 1260 days after the, uh, the abomination of desolation. That is 30 days before the end of Daniel's 70th week. And so that tells us exactly when the seventh trumpet is going to sound. Everybody getting this? The seventh trumpet will sound right at the end, approximately 30 days before the end of Daniel's 70th week. Because it's the days of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound. That's when the mystery of God's finished. That's when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. That's when the time of the Gentiles is over. That's when the seventh angel begins to sound. So that, you know what that proves? That proves that the seventh angel does not sound and the events of the seventh angel's trumpet do not take place until the last 30 days of Daniel's 70th week. Are you getting the significance of that? The seventh trumpet events and judgments of great hail and lightning and thunder take place in the last 30 days of Daniel's 70th week. And what that proves is that that is the end of God's pouring out of his wrath. Because why? When the seventh angel sounds, they say, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. What do we have after Daniel's 70th week? The millennial reign of Christ. See how it all fits together perfectly? Now look, I apologize. This is the most complicated sermon that I've probably ever preached on Bible prophecy, and it's an advanced sermon. And if you're here tonight 
and maybe you know you're a little newer at Bible prophecy, probably a lot of the sermon you know, went over your head. You probably need to go back and listen to Revelation 1 through 9 because this is probably one of the most in-depth, complicated uh, sermons I've ever preached on Bible prophecy. You know, it really assumes that you know the basics. Okay, but you know, we need to know some of the strong meat sometimes of this, uh, this subject. And you know, there's a chart. I've put together a chart that kind of lays this out in a, in a chart. Uh, go to, you can go to kjvprophecy.com. And the Daniel 70th week chart, you know, it, maybe it'll help you to see it in a pictorial representation. And then at the bottom, all the scriptures are there proving all the points are biblical and uh, in line with scripture. But let's quickly finish up Revelation 10 here. It says in verse 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, and it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So here, the angel that stands on the sea and on the earth, that swear by him that liveth forever and ever, he has this little book open in his hand. John is commanded to take the book out of his hand and eat it. He goes to the angel and says to him, Give me the little book. The angel gives him the book. He eats the book. The book is in his mouth sweet as honey, and his belly is made bitter as a result of eating the book. After he eats the book, he's told to go preach. He's told that he must prophesy again before many nations and tongues, people and nations and tongues and kings. Say, what is the little book? Well, go back to Ezekiel chapter number two. Ezekiel chapter number two. Because often in the Bible, the concept of eating a book comes up, and it's always uh, referring to God's word. Like, for example, the Bible says, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. So eating God's word is a concept throughout the Bible because God's word is represented as food. It's our daily bread. The manna that the children of Israel ate is related unto God's word in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. We don't live by bread alone. We live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jeremiah said, thy words were found and I did eat them and thy word was the rejoicing of my heart. Job said, I have esteemed the words of thy mouth more than my necessary food. So Job, Jeremiah, the children of Israel, uh, over and over again, eating the word of God comes up. Look at Ezekiel chapter two. But thou son of man, speaking to Ezekiel, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. He's saying, eat what I give you, Ezekiel. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. So what is Ezekiel being told to eat at the end of chapter 2? A roll of a book. And look what it says in verse 10. And he spread it before me. He spread out the roll. Roll means scroll there. He spreads out the scroll of the book before him. And it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. So the book that Ezekiel is told to eat at the end of chapter 2 is a scroll containing lamentations, mourning, and woe. So not only is that scroll God's word, but it's a very negative portion of God's word, isn't it? Because it's a part of God's word that has to do with lamentations, mourning, and woe. Well, the book that John is being told to eat in Revelation chapter 10 is the same way. It's a book that has to do with the words of God's judgment and wrath upon this earth. And he eats that book and it's in his mouth sweet as honey. Why was the book that John ate in Revelation 10 sweet as honey to his mouth? Because God's word is sweet to the mouth. The Bible says in uh, Psalm chapter 19, the famous passage, the law of the Lord is perfect, verse 7, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. We're talking about the word of God, the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So God's judgments are true and right. 
God's commandments, God's statutes, God's word is perfect. He says, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Watch this, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. So God's word is sweeter than the honeycomb. David said in the book of Psalms that God's word was sweet unto his mouth and to his taste. But why did it make his belly bitter? Because of the negative subject matter. So what the Bible is teaching here is that many negative portions of Scripture, they're sweet to our taste because, honestly, the whole Bible is sweet to our taste. I mean, the whole, we, we, we as Christians, we love the Word of God. And I don't know about you, I love every part of the Word of God. I love the positive parts of the Word of God, and I love the negative parts of the Word of God because I just love God. You know, I just love His Word. But there are parts of it that can make our belly bitter as we read about judgments and lamentations. Whoa, some parts of the Bible make us sorrowful, don't they? Even though they, they're sweet to our taste in the sense that we love God's word, we're sorrowful when we think about unsaved people going to hell, aren't we? I mean, doesn't that make us sorry? We don't question God's justice and God's uh, judgment, but it can still bring sorrow and, and it can bring a, a bitterness to our belly when we think about the wrath that's going to be poured out with the seven trumpets, when we think about the wrath that's going to be poured out with the seven vials. And so when he ate the book, he said it was in his mouth sweet as honey, but as soon as he had eaten it, his belly was bitter. And the angel said to him, uh, thou must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, and uh, we thank you so much for these truths. I, I pray that uh, those that are here would study to show themselves approved. This is not a simple sermon. This was not the milk of the word. This was definitely the strong meat. I went into a lot of subjects that are very deep and complicated, but I pray that many people would understand the things that I preached in this sermon, that they would study and read and, and maybe uh, look at the chart that I've made, maybe make their own chart just based on what the Bible teaches and, and, and come to grips and an understanding with these deep truths of your word and come to a very uh, clear and specific understanding of the book of Revelation through uh, these 22 messages. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.